just want to get right into word. Wow, it's been incredible worship tonight and a ministry time to just dozens and dozens of people that came up here. And uh, so I just want to take a few moments of your time tonight and share a message with you that um, I just really want to get the mind of the Lord to what he wanted me to say here to you all tonight, uh, what he wants to speak to you. And the message I'm going to share with you tonight is, uh, I've, I've only preached this a couple times in different places, a message the Lord gave me on time, and it's, it's, it has such powerful revelation in it. But I want to be real sensitive to the Lord whenever I share this message because it, it really has such an impact in our hearts and our lives. I want to talk to you about breakthroughs tonight and three steps to breakthroughs in our lives. Now, there's been dozens of sermons on breakthroughs. I'm sure you've heard many, many here in this church. But I'm going to take a very familiar story found in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 34. It's a lot of scripture, but it's a story. It's a real story about a real person, a real situation. It wasn't a parable. A parable is a parallel. It's a, it's a, a story about something in the natural that parallels to the spiritual. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like. And so that's a parable or a parallel. This is not, this is not that. This is a story about a real person, a real situation, and a real resolution and a breakthrough. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would as I'm speaking today, that you would speak to the hearts of men and women and boys and girls here this evening, God. I thank you for this opportunity to once again stand before your people and share your word. I'm humble to God that you're trusting me one more time with your word and your people. And may tonight be a night of breakthroughs for everyone here. Maybe little breakthroughs or big breakthroughs, God, but Lord, breakthroughs into your presence and your power for their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's the story found in Mark chapter 5. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And he begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. And Jesus went with him. And a great multitude followed him and thronged him, or they pressed, they pressed trying to get to touch him. Now a certain woman, everybody say a certain woman, had a flow of blood for 12 years. Let me just stop there a minute. Certain woman, why doesn't it give her name? It gave Jairus his name. Why doesn't it give her name? I believe any time you see one of these stories in the Bible and there's no name there, you can put your name there. You can be that certain woman, or you can be that certain person, or that certain man, that you can put your name right there. God is saying, this is, this is for you. A certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. She had a blood disease, some type of bleeding disease. And had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in herself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said, You're, You see the multitude thronging you? And you say, In other words, this is a ridiculous question, Jesus. You're asking who touched your clothes with all of these people pressing in? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith, your faith, your faith, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now, this is a familiar story. And if you've been in church any length of time at all, you've heard some preacher preach on this. It's full of powerful biblical principles and faith-building 
things. Some of the obvious truths we see in this story is bring your problems to Jesus. Press through the crowd, the circumstances, and the doubt. Touching Jesus is more important than people touching you. Your faith can make a demand on the power of God for your life. All of those are biblical uh, rhema words, life lessons from this particular one. And as we look at this story once again, I, I want to look at it in the context of three steps to breakthroughs in your life. Now, the term breakthrough infers that there's something holding us back from moving forward, achieving our goals, or keeping us from an ultimate victory. And Satan is the master at putting roadblocks in our paths to slow us down, to stop us from what God has called each of us to do. So let's look at some things that can help us press through those things in our lives. The first one is found in verse 25. A certain woman had. Say that with me. A certain woman had. Now notice the terminology. She had. All of us have some hads. Every one of us has a had. It could be a physical limitation, a sickness, or a disease like this woman. It could be a failure in your life of some kind. Perhaps you've had a situation in life when you feel like you came out to be a loser. No matter what your had is, don't allow it to be your identity. Because here's the first thing, the first step to breakthrough I want to share with you. Never allow your issue to become your identity. She had an issue. Her issue was this blood disease. Now, never allow the problem, the challenge, the mistake that you've made in life, the things you've gone through, never allow those issues to become your identity. She was sick. She had a disease. But she didn't, she didn't make that disease her identity. She made it her adversary. Yep. She approached it that way. Well, pastor, but I've gone through this and I've had this. Had. We've all had, we all have hads. We all have a had in our life. You may have two or three hads right now in your life that you're dealing with. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We've all got a had. She, this woman had an issue of blood, but she didn't allow the issue to become her identity. I've gone through a divorce. I'm a divorce. No, no, you've gone through it, but that's not your identity. Okay, that's not your identity. Well, I, well, I've been, I've been beat up, busted. I've been, I've been in jail. I've been jail. I've done this. Okay, that's not your. If you're new in Christ, that's not your identity. Amen. Let me tell you something. I did one time. I, I mentioned that word divorce. My oldest daughter went through a divorce. She was on staff with us for 14 years. One of the most godly women I know. Married one a kid in the church. I can't say too much about it. I know this is online. But she went through hell. Went through hell. The young man that was on my staff just went through hell. And, and there, there really was no other option. I know what it's like to hold my grown daughter until she cries to the point when she, she throws up. I hold her in my arms. I know what it's like. I was in a meeting one time with ministers. There was 19 of us in a room. And uh, in the denomination we were in, it had been many years ago, 20 years ago, they passed this. They used to not allow anybody who had been divorced to, to have credentials. And I never understood that. And I never honored it in my church. I just looked at the person where they were, not what they been, how they live in now. Okay. And so... I was in this meeting, and it had to be adopted in, the, in our district that we were in. It was just a, just, a, a, just a typical, you just had to adopt it. You know, you had to vote to adopt that resolution into the local bylaws of that district. Okay? It's just a, something you do. But there was this old boy sitting across from me at the table. And there's 19 of us ministers in that room. And he was pounding the table. Let's go on, never have a divorced person in my pulpit. Let's go on, never. And, just, just, and he was just red at the face. And he had a huge church, probably about 150 people. <laughs> and he was just going on. And I usually just sat at that table. I had, as far as numbers go, the largest church of anybody sitting in that room, by far. 
But I used to just kept my mouth shut and just, you know, I, I was an executive presbyter. And, uh, but I had all I wanted to him. And my redneck roots started rising up. And he finally kind of run out of breath for a minute. And I just kind of raised my hand. I said, Mr. Superintendent, may I say something? He said, oh, yes, brother, brothers. I said, you know, guys, this is probably something that none of us will ever agree completely on in life. But let me just ask you a question. I looked right across the table at him. I said, why is it that this is the only quote unquote sin that you all want to take around the cross instead of through the cross? And the room got silent. And his face got red. And his neck got red. And his ears got red. And his nose got red. And you could see in his little pea brain, he was trying to think of something to say. But what could he say? I mean, what could he do? I'm, I mean, like, what, what's, what's he going to come back with? He couldn't think of anything. The superintendent said, I thank you, brother. Brothers, all in favor, aye. Everybody raised their hand but him. Bob, motion passes. I don't put up that nonsense. I don't care what your had was. Don't let your had become your identity. Oh, if you're in Christ Jesus, old things have passed away, and all things have all things. Not 99.9% not, not of things. All things have become new. Never allow your issue to become your identity. She could say, I'm just a poor sick woman. I just stay here. You know what happens when you let your issue to become your identity? If you do that, then your future will be full of failure. I won't say it again. If you let your issue become your identity, then your future will be full of failure. But I've gone through bankruptcy. Hey, look at the people around the world that are billionaires today that went through bankruptcy more than once. Okay. Never allow your issue. The devil will try to, to assume an identity, tries to get you and I to assume an identity that is different from what God gave you. I'm going to step out in the water right now because I think I have that, that, that ec relationship equity here with the leadership. That's the number one goal of Satan with homosexuality. It's to steal their identity. Because if you don't know who you are, you don't know your identity, you'll never fulfill your destiny. You, you'll ne that, that's what it's all about. That's the key element, is to steal your identity. And you'll never become what God created you to become to begin with on planet Earth. But you were created in the image of God. You are wonderfully made. You are not a mistake. You're a chosen people. You're a royal generation. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Just like this woman. Don't allow your issue to become your identity. Satan will always get us and try to get us to focus on failures in our life. We can do 10 things right, one thing wrong, and what does the enemy bring back to us over and over and over again? By the way, what do we bring back to us? Just our own consciousness over and over and over. I used to, as a young preacher, I may every now and then hit the ball and get a first base hit on Sunday morning, and people come up to me, oh, that was so good, Pastor Gary, you're such a good preacher, good preacher, good preacher. 20 people could do that, and then one old person could come up to me and say, you know, pastor, I think you just need to study a little bit more. And I'd go home like this. 12 people got saved that morning. And I go home depressed until I learned that everybody's got an opinion. That's just half of the saying, but everybody's got an opinion. I learned that 18 years old at the first United Mind Workers of America Union meeting, and that's as far as I'm going. And an old boy got up, made a comment, and that was only half of his comment, but I've never forgotten it or his face. And it's true. Everybody has an opinion. 
Never allow your issue. Are you getting anything tonight? Never allow your issue to become your identity. Your identity is who God made you, what he's called you to do, what he's equipped you to do, what he's empowered you to do. That's your identity. Your identity is in him. It's not in a failure. It's not in a problem. It's not in, it's not in something, well, I don't have what other people have. Well, that's all right. You don't need what other people have because you're not other people. You're you. Celebrate what you have. Never, I came up with this saying several years ago, never let go in the night what you got in the light. Now, light always represents revelation knowledge from the Word of God. Have you ever prayed and got a word from God and you were so excited about something? You got it in the light. And then the night came. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and the night was longer than the light moment. The light moment could have been just real quick, but then the night comes. Well, did God really want me to do that? Does the Lord really? I'm just not too sure God's called me to do that. I know the Lord, I know God spoke me to work in the nursery, but I didn't know the baby smelled like this. I, I just, I just don't know. I just don't understand. I, I, I mean, I mean, after all, if God called me here, I, I thought it'd be more fun than this. I didn't know they cried all the time. I thought, I thought I just rocked them and sang lullabies to them. And I didn't know all this was going on and, and, and just going on over there too. And, and it's going on over here too. And, Oh, Jesus, help me. Never let go in the night what you got in the light. Because there'll always be a night time to challenge the revelation from the Word of God that you've got. There'll always be a challenge to it. There'll always be a challenge. The devil comes to steal the Word that's sown in your heart, Mark chapter 4. All right, back to this message tonight. Here's the second thing. Verse 27. She came behind him in the crowd. The crowd represents adversity. Now listen to me. Step number two, never allow your adversity to become your audience. Never allow your adversity to become your audience. You see, there's all kinds of crowds. She, she wasn't there for the crowd. The crowd was adversity, but they were not her audience. Jesus was. She didn't get her attention on the crowd. She had her attention on Jesus. See, there's all kinds of, there's the doubt crowd. Everybody say doubt. doubt. They don't believe that anything can happen. That's the doubt crowd. They just don't believe anything can happen. That's not your audience. And you're not there to convince them that it does. The doubt crowd don't believe anything can happen. Everybody say discouragement. There's a discouragement crowd. They don't believe it will happen for you. They believe it happens for other people, but it won't happen for you. They'll encourage you by discouraging you. Well, bless your heart. I, I, I know, but I, I know you've been praying for that. I, I, I know you have, but uh, you know, you know, God's not going to do that for you. I mean, you're just not in line for that. You're just not. You're just not. It's just not for you. You know, God only does that for special people, and you're just not one of them, honey. It's just not going to happen for you. That's a dis and and they do that under the auspices. I'm an encourager. Well, get those encouragers away from me. Some people call it constructive criticism. I call it destructive criticism. But there's another crowd. There's a doubt crowd. There's a discouragement crowd. Then there's a depression crowd. They don't believe it should happen for you. Not only do they believe it won't, they don't believe it should. You're not worthy. Why should God do anything for you? Why should God help you? Now, what would have happened if this woman, had, if, her ad, if her adversity, the crowd, had become her audience? They would have filled her with that. First of all, they would have said, it's illegal for you to be out here. Because by law, she was unclean, and it was illegal for her to be there. So she was breaking the law. Should we ever break the law? Well, I don't know. Just ask this old gal here if it worked out for her. She pressed through the crowd. It was against the Jewish uh, ritual laws to be, because she was sick with a blood disease, to be out in public like that. But she was going to die. So what are they going to do to her? Put her in jail? She's going to die anyway. 
And so, so she presses through this crowd, and she doesn't allow the crowd to be her audience. Because if they had become their audience, they would have discouraged her. They would have brought doubt. They would have brought discouragement. They would have brought depression. She would have never made it to Jesus. So you've got to find the crowd that's with you and speak to them. You know, Jesus only spent his time with two types of people. When, I, when this revelation came to me, I had so much more fun being a pastor. And I don't mean it in a derogatory way, but let me just tell you what I, what I learned. And when I learned this, Jesus only spent his time with two groups of people. Now, he interacted with all types of people, but I'm talking about the time that he invested, that he willingly spent time with, those who received his ministry and those who ministered to him. I will say it again, those who received his ministry and those who ministered to him. Most pastors in America spend 80% of their time with people who don't care about them, who don't care about the vision of the church or anything else trying to get them satisfied or get them back in the church and that sort of thing. If you run a business, you know what I'm talking about because people are people, whether in a church or in the business. If you're a teacher at school, you're an administrator, they're the same way at school. You've got a certain amount of teachers, certain amount of people in administration that you've always got to be dealing with. You've always got to be have. You've always got to be fix, fixing their emotions. You've always got to be doing. Does anybody know what I'm talking about in here? Okay, all right, yeah, yeah. Now, if you're one of those people, bless your heart, just get saved tonight and delivered from that. But, but th that's what you have is, is you, you spend so much time. Jesus, Jesus, look, the Pharisees spent their time trying to find out how to kill Jesus. It looks to me like he would have just spent a lot of time with them. Look, boys, you're wrong. Don't you understand I'm the Messiah? You boys are wrong. You're wasting your time. Listen, don't you know I'm the Son of God? Well, he did all that, and it made him mad. So he didn't go spend time with them. Where did he go? He went to this short feller's house called Zacchaeus because he said, I'll feed you. And Zacchaeus fed him his disciples, and the Pharisees complained about it. So Jesus didn't get up from the table eating fried chicken and gravy and biscuits and go to the Pharisees and say, well, I'm sorry you're offended. Hey, that's a whole sermon right there. I could just slide off the deep end right now talking about being offended. Uh, that'd be too much fun, though. Everybody's offended today. Three words, get over it. Grow up. No, Jesus didn't do that, did he? He didn't go chase the Pharisees down and say, now, boys, I, I didn't mean nothing about going to Zacchaeus' house. I really didn't. I, didn't. I didn't mean to offend you. Yes, he did. He meant to offend them. The truth offends people who are not living in the truth and who don't want the truth. Somebody says, the truth shall set you free. Yeah, but it'll make you miserable first if you're not living right. And don't tell me it won't. If you know the truth and you're not living in the truth, it's going to bring conviction to your life. And it's going to get you right. But it'll make you miserable first. But these guys weren't going to have it. Never allow your adversity to become your audience. Jesus stood before Pilate in Matthew 27. Then Pilate said, do you, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And Pilate knew they were lying. Three times he said, I find no fault in this guy. The Bible says he knew it was for envy that they had him up there to begin with, but he was a politician. And not all of them, but most politicians don't do what's right. And he answered him not a word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Don't waste your time on people who have a contrary agenda to you. Now, I, I, now before you jump off the deep end here, don't, don't think that I just said you should witness to people about Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about. We're to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. We're to witness and tell people. About, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who want to come against you and debate you and cut you down and tear you down, whether it's at the office or running a backhoe or driving a truck or teaching or whatever it may be, who are just constantly trying to run you down. Don't, don't spend time with those people. Don't spend time allowing them to hammer you time and time and time again. Jesus didn't.
Did you hear me? Jesus did not do that. In fact, I can show you in the Word of God where in a couple of chapters he just went off on them. People with an agenda are not interested in truth. They make up their own to validate their actions. As a young pastor, uh, we pioneer in a church. They launch them now, but years ago we pioneered them. Uh, it's a lot harder than launching. Um, and uh, somebody in my church, I, I'm, I'm working at a full-time job from midnight to 8 in the morning, uh, six days a week, preaching three times a week, doing weddings, doing funerals, everything else that you do, and, you know, pioneering a church, doing, you know, I'm just trying to learn as I go. And the first time I preached three sermons in a week was the first week I was a pastor. And I'm working 48 hours a week at a job, plus mowing my yard, taking care of my wife and kids. And so I'd somebody get mad and leave the church, you know. And I'd, 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 go, I'd go visit with them. Bless your heart. I'm just, you know, what's wrong, brother? How can I help you? And I, I just miss you. And, and, and I was so naive. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't know what I was doing. I was kind of learning as I go. And my heart was pure, but I was naive. And I'm telling you, every one of those people that I went to, and I sat down with them and said, you know, I just want to come visit with you. I know you've been gone from the church four or five weeks now, and I heard you weren't happy about something. What can I do? And all in the world I did was give them a platform to chew me out, call me out, tell me about every bad thing that I'd ever done, every bad sermon I'd preached, everything just ripped me. And I would leave there beat up emotionally, even though I knew that 90% of what they said wasn't true and, and that they're the ones that had to, I would leave there beat up. And the last time I did that, I went to a couple. They were a precious couple. They'd been coming to our church. They were, they were older. They were in their 50s at the time. And I was late 20s. And, and now, you know, I'm, I'm beyond all that. And, uh, but they, they were good givers. And they didn't have any children. And our youth got up on one Sunday morning and did a human video. How many of y'all know what that is? That was a big thing in the 80s. Okay. And so they played a song, and they moved around and did stuff. Oh, that made them mad. How dare we do something like that in the church? Well, I didn't know that's what it was. And I just weren't coming. So I called them. I made an appointment. I drove 30 miles to their house, sat down. She had made a big chocolate pie. Oh, she could make a chocolate pie. And she just talked going out of the oven. I thought, well, this is not going to be a wasted trip. And I went down and sat down with them in their living room. And as God is my witness, she went in the kitchen, cut two pieces of chocolate pie, gave one to her husband on the plate. She had the other one on the plate and sat there and chewed me out while they ate chocolate pie and didn't give me a piece. Oh it wouldn't have been half as bad if she gave me a piece of chocolate pie. At least it, mm, yeah, whatever, yeah, go on, whatever, huh? Did, I mean, I, can you imagine? Didn't even give me a piece of chocolate pie. And they're sitting there eating that chocolate pie and chewing me out over them playing some song and the youth up on the platform. I want to say, thank God that we got youth coming to the church. You know, I left there so broken I was crying. I don't know if it's because of what they said or because I didn't get any pie. But I was, I was weeping. I said, God, if this is the ministry, I'm done. If this is what it means to be a pastor, I'm done. I've got a full-time job anyway. I'm going to hand this over to son. I'm out, God, I'm out. And the Holy Spirit whispered to me and said, I didn't call you to do this. You didn't ask me about this. This is not what I called you to do. And he began to show me what Jesus did. Now, should I go after lost sheep? Yes, but these people weren't lost sheep. They were mad people. And they didn't come to me. They didn't, have the, they didn't have the integrity to say, Pastor, can we come talk to you about something and share our, share our concern? No, they didn't do that. And I went to them, and they were rude and disrespectful to me and talked down to me and all this kind of stuff. I've never done it since then. Not once. Now, have I met with people that come to me? Absolutely. But I've never chased anybody to their home since then because I will not allow my adversity to become my audience. You get that? Okay. 
Now, you take that and over and uh, that template and put it into your life. The same at your business, at your job, at your school, wherever, and even in your church here. Okay. You see, when your adversity becomes your audience, your focus on Jesus begins to fade. You spend your time defending your position instead of discovering your promise. Would you like me to say that again? See, when your adversity becomes your audience, your focus on Jesus begins to fade. Will you spend your time defending your position instead of discovering your promise? See, for every problem, God has a promise. For every problem, God has a promise. Say it with me. For every problem, God has a promise. So when you have a problem, find the promise. Here's the last one. Verse 34. Are you getting anything tonight? All right. Verse 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now, she got a miracle. I mean, there's no doubt about it. She, she had, she'd had this for many years. Uh, the doctors couldn't cure her. She was on her way out. She's going to die. She, financially, she couldn't do anything else. So this, this was a bona fide, this was a real miracle. God healed her body completely. It was a manifestation of God's grace in her life. But when we have miracles happen, here's the third one. Never allow your miracle to become your monument. Never allow your miracle to become your monument. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Why do we build monuments? To commemorate great accomplishments, right? But sometimes those monuments signify the end of an error. If you go to uh, Chicago, outside of the big auditorium where they play basketball, the Bulls play, you'll see Michael Jordan, Monument Michael Jordan. Okay. Well, he's not playing anymore. One of the greatest that ever played the game. But when I look at that, it, it, it's, it's, I recognize what he's done, but it also signifies the end of an error. He's not playing now. You, you look at other monuments, and that's what I've seen them all around the world. That's what they, when you look at them, it means the end of something. Okay. Many times, we get so focused on what God has done for us that we forget that God's not done with us. Let me say it again. We get so focused on what God has done for us, we forget that God is not done with us. And when we make our, our, our miracles a monument, we just kind of sit down and give up on, oh, that's wonderful. Look what God has done. Look what God has done. Look what God has done. Yeah, yeah. And there's a song we used to sing in church. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. I'm sure Pastor Daniel could really tear that up. Hey! Is that my Pastor Daniel impression? Maybe I'll try it again. Hey! hey, hey. He could probably sing that, okay? Well, let's find a look what the Lord has done unless you stay there. So you don't make your miracle into a monument. This is a story of, of, past, of, of King David when he was a little boy. And he, and he goes as a teenager to the camp, of course, and Goliath comes out. And if you've been in the church at all, you know the story of how this young teenager walks out with a pocket full of rocks and a slingshot and goes up to Goliath, the greatest warrior on planet Earth at that time, and drops him with a rock one time. Boom, bam, gone. And then takes his sword out and cuts his head off. A great, great story. But, but some stuff happened before that. Because in order to get permission from King Saul to even go up and attack this guy, he says, look, Saul, look, king, let me just explain to you. King says, you're just a boy. He says, let me explain something to you. I'll take care of my daddy's sheep. And a bear came out. Now, y'all know about bears. You have bears everywhere around here. I love to bear hunt. I just love to hunt. I don't care to shoot anything. I just love to hunt. But I love to bear hunt. Some asked me, would you like to go bear? I'd love to go bear hunting, but I don't really need another bear rug. 
I've got a full body mount bear in one part of the basement. I've got two bear rugs on the walls. I've got one laying on the floor. You know, you can just use so many bear rugs in your house. And the lower level's my area. The upper level's my wife's area. So there's not anything going in our bedroom. But he says a bear came out. Now, I know what it's like to stalk a bear with a bow. I stalked six of them within range with a bow. But this boy killed, I, I don't know if he killed him with a stick or a sling, probably a slingshot. Some, I, I, dude, I don't know what he did. But he killed a bear. Not only that, he killed a lion. Now, that's stepping up right there. That's a step up, okay? That's a step up. I was bow hunting in Missouri one time 25 years ago, and I could see in, and there's this, uh, this little roadbed here. I heard something, and about 60 yards down, a mountain lion walked out. Now, they say we don't have them, but the con conservation department lies. We do have them. They've been killed. We've seen several. And he walks out, and he looks around. He turns and walks the other direction. David killed a bear, and he killed a lion. And he says, King, uh, this, this guy's not going to be any different. Don't you know he was speaking with an anointing on his life for the king to allow him to do that? I mean, most kings would say, sure you did, son. Yeah, it's, it's a nice story. That's a nice story. Go get, get out of here. But there was something about that boy's voice. There was something about what he said that convinced the king to roll the dice on the whole nation of Israel on a teenage boy. But you see, the bear didn't become his monument, and the lion didn't become his monument. They were just the next challenge in his life to his destiny and his purpose in his life. Never allow your miracle to become your monument. God healed me great. He wants to heal you again. God has blessed me good, but he wants to bless you and somebody else. God, has, God get blessed me financially. Don't quit there. He wants to bless you more. Don't stop. If you're still breathing, if you're still living, God still has miracles for you. God still has breakthroughs for you. God still has plateaus for for you. God still has accomplishments for you. Don't allow your miracle to become your monument. Yeah. Amen. I have so many stories to tell. We don't have time. You've got to live with an expectation of more. You, you've got to live with it. You've got to live with it. One more story. Is that okay? Over almost 32 years, 31 and a half years ago now, God called us from that church that we pioneered that was going great, was going wonderful, no reason to leave. But he called us to another church in southeast Missouri, in a town. The church is 103 years old this year. And it was 72 or 3 years old then. And uh, it was a good church, good people. The charismatic movement had missed it completely. It was 40 years behind the times. It was the pastor had died of cancer. They'd been without a pastor a year. I was the minimum age of a resume that they would take. I was 35. And it's the first time I sent a resume to anybody because when you pioneer church, you don't need a resume. You know. And, and it's a long story, but God divinely called us there. I remember they called us in one weekend, asked us to come up to interview. And I didn't want to go interview. It was in Missouri. I'm from Kentucky. I wasn't going to Missouri. I'll go to Texas. I ain't going to Missouri. But just to obey God, we went. And we were the third couple they interviewed that weekend. The other two were much more experienced ministers than me. Uh, they, they had much higher credentials, academic credentials. One was a doctorate. The other had a master's degree. I'm a Berean boy. I got a correspondence course degree. Okay. Because I'm working. I, I work in the mines and past. I mean, I, I had two kids. I, I couldn't do it. And uh, we were the third ones they interviewed. And here's what the board said to me. It says, oh, brother, brothers. I said, I'm just scary, okay? They said, uh, these other two pastors that we've interviewed this weekend, both of them told us that God spoke to them 
to come pastor this church. What do you say? I said, well, one of them's wrong. <laughs> well, they were. God's not that confused. They didn't need two pastors. They needed one. Of course, they were thinking I was going to say, God has spoken to me. And I didn't. I said, gentlemen, all I know is that God has spoken to me that he's moving us from where we are. But I don't know that it's here, and I'm not too sure it is. I think we ought to just fast and pray and see what God says. And I didn't. Because I didn't want to go. I want to go to Texas. Now, if I'd have been up here to Alaska, I would have said, I want to go to Alaska. Long story short, God led us there, divinely led us there. It's a church of about 220 people, maybe. And it took off immediately and began to grow. At one point, we're in five services, Saturday night one, four on Sunday. And uh, we still couldn't park the people. We bought a building that we're in now. We just added 22,000 feet to it, or the square feet the other couple of three years ago. Uh, multiple services. Our sanctuary is comparable. It's not as tall, but it seats 1,200. And, um, and then we started campuses. Everything I touched, everything we did, it's like boom, bam, it's awesome. And then I had something happen. God had to make some adjustments. And it was a hard adjustment. I don't know if, if I have time to tell this story. I basically had a staff coup. And I lost 11 full-time employees in six months. Most of them in four. Five pastors, an administrator. Uh, it, was, it was tough. It was led by one of them that I just won't say anymore because we're live streaming. And they did everything to destroy the church. We lost over 300 people, a million dollars in income, and a black eye in the community. They tried to destroy my integrity. They told every kind of lie that they could make up about me, and many people believed it. To the point to where I didn't know from one Sunday to the next where I was going to be there or not. At that same time, I got a call from a church a few states away that needed a senior pastor to come in and help them. They'd been one of the largest churches in America at one time, but their pastor retired and then he died. And the guy behind him really wasn't the right guy. Then the next guy had a moral failure and they were down to about 1,200 people. They were at once over five or 6,000. That a 5,200 seat auditorium. I know, I walked in it and looked at it. They had every kind of building. You had a four-story office building they just finished. They had a high a school through high school close to the interstate in a large city. And I thought, God's going to reward me for my faithfulness, my last season of life to go and, and, and go there. Because I felt like that church in four or five years could be 10,000 people. Prayed and fasted. After a couple of weeks, the Lord said, no. I said, I'm good. I don't want to be anywhere you're not. I don't want to be anywhere you I've been out of the will of God before. I don't want to get back in that ditch. I'll go to a cotton field and start over again if you want me to. I don't care. And that's been 11 years ago. And I talked to my young lead pastor this afternoon and talked to my wife today. The glory of God came in the auditorium in the first service today. It was amazing. Both services were packed. Pastor told me, he said people were complaining they didn't have any place to park in the second service and it was just packed, set a record for kids. Our other campuses are doing the thing, same thing. Things that we got the best staff in the world where it's blowing and going, the presence of God, the power of God, amazing. All because I didn't allow those miracles through that year to become my monument. Never allow that to happen. Rose and I started in ministry with this mantra. Father, 
If you've ever done it for anybody, anywhere, at any time, or anything, you'll do it for us right here and right now. And I believe for Wasilla, Alaska, God is moving in a great way. But each of you today, if, if, you will, if you will put these three principles to practice in your life, never, never allow your issue to become your identity. Don't allow your adversities to become your audience. And never, never make your miracles a monument. It's a miracle that we're in this building tonight. I'm telling you, it's a miracle that we're in this building. But don't make a monument out of it. Because this is not the end, my friend. This is the beginning of the next season of fruitfulness and the power of God. You've been praying, Alaska, hear the word of the Lord. I've heard you pray that for 20 some years. You shall be saved. Well, you're just now getting in a sweet spot to where that can happen as you reach this, this, this great state of Alaska. And not only here, I've been telling Pastor Daniel, God's not building this church just for Alaska. He's building this church to help people around the world. Come on, stand to your feet and give God praise tonight, would you? God bless you. Pastor Daniel Bracken here. I hope you enjoyed the service with us here at Kings, Alaska. If you've never received Jesus, won't you do it now? If you've never given your heart to Christ, won't you do it right now? Would you pray with me? Just pray right out loud wherever you are. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Amen. Let me pray for you. I pray, Holy Spirit, touch, fill, help, strengthen, break every chain, and use these that have prayed that prayer to change the world in Jesus' name. If you prayed to receive Christ, won't you let us know? We'd love to help you grow in the things of God. Text us at 907-357-2065. You can see the number on your screen and text SAVED and we'll help you grow in the things of God. God bless you and remember, God's on the throne and the devil's been defeated. Peace.